Um, okay, so welcome everyone to the School Climate Emergency Q&A with your local MPs and councillor. Ben and I now will start by introducing ourselves, the event and the MPs and councillor present for this event. Um, hi, my name is Ben. Today, Ryan and I will be co-hosting this great <laughs> event. A little, bit, a little bit about me. I'm currently in my final year of sixth form. I study maths, economics and biology. Climate change is a topic I've always been very passionate about, ever since seeing these devastating images of rainforests being cleared, polar ice caps melting, and animals being left stranded without a home. After doing some more of my own research, I realized I could be involved in the fight against it. So I attended youth climate strikes, entered the Bank of England essay competition on climate change and the economy, and participated in the Youth Climate Assembly. By being involved in all those events, I was able to put my viewpoint forward, but also discover a breadth of passion from other young people. In, a in addition to this, I presented at the first Brighton Climate Assembly meeting on climate change and its impact on the youth. It was an incredible experience and was encouraging to see that councillors were eager to hear the perspective of the youth. I believe we should continue to voice our opinions as they are so important and, the, and through these events we can be heard. I'm also on the Brighton Hove Youth Council and we're currently running a campaign to reduce plastic wastage and produce, uh, promote being environmentally friendly. Hopefully by the end of this event we will gain a better understanding of the local action against climate change so we can continue to fight this crucial issue. I'll now hand over to Rania to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Rania and I'll be co-hosting this event alongside Ben. I'm a final year undergraduate student at the University of Sussex studying international development and sociology. My strong will to tackle climate change started in secondary school when a friend and I applied for a grant to go to Iceland to explore local ecological practices happening over there in eco schools, organic farms, eco villages, and by meeting local climate activists that had been fighting climate change in their own unique ways. We made a short documentary showing concrete actions in regards to climate change, which we showed to our school and started a conversations about the need for degrowth. Since moving to Brighton for university, I have been involved in the youth strike and more specifically in setting up a youth assembly on climate in Brighton, which focused on the topic of transport. It was an amazing experience to see how active and informed young people are about climate change and how much enthusiasm there is for action and change. The creative energy and the discussions that came out of this youth assembly was a very empower th empowering thing to be a part of. And I would love for this project to continue in the future to keep young people directly involved in the decision-making processes on climate issues in Brighton and Hove. This is why this event is such an amazing opportunity to have us young people living in Brighton directly involved and at the forefront of climate actions. What better way to engage climate conversations than in schools, a place where young people are here to learn from each other, a place to discuss and present ideas to fellow students and teachers. I strongly believe there is a need to integrate climate education in the curriculum, not only to learn about the devastating effects of climate change on the planet and in our lives, but also to encourage change and ideas for action. For this event, we have invited the three local MPs for Brighton and Hove, representing the Labour Party and the Green Party, as well as a Conservative councillor for Brighton and Hove to answer your questions about their views on a variety of topics on climate change. This will allow for a breadth of views on your questions. And now to introduce the speakers. Uh, firstly, Caroline Lucas. Uh, Lucas. Uh, she is currently and was the first Green Member of Parliament. She was elected the first leader of the party in 2008 and previously was a member of the European Parliament. She is known for campaigning green economics, localization, and being a strong world activist ready to challenge any issue. She's won numerous awards, many of which are for being the best politician of the year and even being named by The Guardian as one of the 50 people who could save the planet. Lloyd Russell Moyle is a Labour Member of Parliament. He has consistently fought for the youth, having acted as Vice President of the European Youth Voice Forum and in 2018 launched an inquiry into the role and sufficiency of youth work. He is currently the Shadow Minister for Natural Environment and Air Quality. Peter Kyle is a British Labour Party politician and former charity sector executive. He has been the Member of Parliament for Hove since the May 2015 general election. Since April 2020, he has served as the Shadow Minister for Victims and Youth Justice as a member of the opposition front bench. Samir Bagan <clears throat> was elected to Brighton and Hove City Council in May 2019. Samir is a chartered town planner, a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, 
and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He was sitting on the advisory board for the Citizen Assembly on Climate in Brighton. So just before we get um, move on to the questions, I would like to remind the students that before asking the question, could you say your name and which school you are from first? And also for the speakers, as it's quite a time pressured event, um, if you could limit your answers to a minute, then that would be perfect. But um, if you go, if you start to go slightly over, we might have to cut you off. Um, I hope that's okay with everyone. And um, moving on to our first question is asked by Danny and Samir and Lloyd will answer this. Um, hello. Uh, how has, oh, sorry, Danny Blatchington Mill. How has COVID-19 affected Brighton & Hove's environmental goals and what is being done to deal with these effects? Fantastic. Um, Thank you, Dan. Shall I kick off, Ben? Yeah, that was perfect for me. Good answer, Ben. Excellent. That's lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Danny, for that, for that question. I think, obviously, I think I'm going to say what, you know, you and, and everybody else here would have, would have already heard, which is, that COVID has accelerated things that have already been happening in a sense. And as a, uh, as a city, we've had to respond, if you like, and we've had to look at our environmental goals and, and look where we can um, probably do more things quickly, but also do them differently. So obviously the Citizens Assembly was, was mentioned and that was always conceived as a vehicle to bring people together in a physical space where we can have um, that that conversation, but you know, after after weeks of debate, we had we had to move that online. You know, and I'm sure you know Rani and Ben, who were part of the process, will will appreciate that it it was a success, and it was obviously run under different um, circumstances to the ones that it was already conceived it would run under. Uh, but it's achieved the goals that it set out. And actually, you know, as, as a member of the advisory group for that myself, I thought it went really, really well. And I attended some of the sessions. The, the city if itself... You could, uh, sorry, wrap up quickly. Yeah, sorry. I'll do that. I mean, the city itself has done a lot of stuff. One of them is, is if you like, again, give more voice to the uh, cross-member working groups. So they've been, uh, their work has been accelerated more importantly, I think, recognizes the interdependencies and the relationships between health, economic development, our industry, our office space, our housing stock. And I think hopefully you'll see more of great thinking on that coming forward. Thank you for your answer. Um, now. Hiya. Um, look, I, I think that COVID has helped and at the same time has put back different elements of our challenge to really make Brighton a leading city in tackling climate change and the ecological um, uh, disaster that is facing us. Some of that is about making modal shifts of how people travel. Some of that has been really positive, you know, kind of people have been walking more, they're getting out in their communities, we've seen a reduction in car use, and that has allowed the city to temporarily at one point close Madeira Drive, although I think it's a great shame it's had to be reopened because it's not helped the businesses reopening it and it's now made it less accessible for uh, people who walk and cycle, but we'll fix that. Um, but it's allowed us to experiment on some of those things and some of them will be right, some of them will need tweaking, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that everything's right, but I think that has allowed an opportunity for that that would have been much harder to do otherwise. At the same time, there are difficulties on that modal shift to transport, less people are using the bus, um, you know, and that makes it more difficult to look at investing in new buses and different kinds of buses that we need to do because some of our most polluted streets, of course, are also the streets that are buses only. So there are some real interesting issues there. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also, I think, have seen people connecting to communities because I think part of tackling climate change is also tackling the consumption and production of how we um, consume things and how society produces things in our everyday lives. And what we have seen is people connecting more to local shops, particularly in the first lockdown, connecting to local communities. And I think if we can bring that forward to make sure then we start to look at how we develop um, producing food locally, for example. There is a fantastic review of our farmland estate. Brighton & Hove is one of the biggest landowners on the South Downs, is the biggest landowner in Brighton. 
um, and we own huge numbers of farms, but those farms are monoculture kind of farms, you know, plowed up. And actually, let's think about, let's learn from places elsewhere in Sussex where they've really started to develop community farming as well that brings people back to a sense of being able to feed themselves within our biosphere. So there are some really great things that are happening as well. Some of that has been exacerbated and improved by COVID. Some of it Thank you, has Lord, been put back. Sorry, I have to cut you off. Yeah, no, thank no. you for your answer. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much. So the second question is from Lily and it'll be answered by Caroline Lucas and then Peter Kyle. Patchen High School. Brighton was recently voted the most eco-friendly city in the UK. But why is it Brighton households are not able to recycle much of our neighbouring towns and cities? Brighton only recycles 30% of all household waste, whereas the national average is 44%. Why is this and what are you going to do to change this? Thank you very much. So, Caroline? Well, thanks so much, Lily, and I share your frustration. Um, it is crazy that we aren't able to recycle more. A simple answer is that we are locked into a contract with a company called Veolia. It's a so-called private finance initiative, which means that we are locked into that contract until 2033. I might just say that the Greens opposed that uh, when it was first signed in 2003. But essentially, to break the contract will cost us now over £200 million, and the contract requires us to send a certain amount of waste to the New Haven incinerator every year. So that's a built-in incentive not to recycle more because we have to feed that incinerator. Plus when it comes to plastics, I mean, I share your, your kind of bewilderment. Why aren't we recycling more plastics in Brighton? It turns out that again, Veolia runs the Hollingdean uh, Waste Center. And I visited there and I asked them, why can't you recycle the pots and so forth and the yogurt things that the other places can. And they basically said it would cost them a million pounds to put in the machinery necessary to sort that waste. The council understandably doesn't have a million pounds down the back of the sofa. Um, so I spoke with Michael Gove when he was the environment minister to say, look, how are you going to help from the um, national level so that we've got the money to be able to put in the machinery in this waste center so that we can recycle these plastics. Um, that never happened. I mean, he said he might be interested in it. It never happened. Food waste very, very quickly. Um, the Greens have been outvoted on the council when we tried to bring in recycling uh, of food waste, but there is a scheme that's being developed now. Uh, moreover, the Environment Bill will require it by 2023, so hopefully things will change very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter? Um, thanks very much. I'm actually timing myself, so I stick to a minute <laughs> so I can make your job a bit easier. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with the vast majority of, of, of what Caroline has said. I think everyone on this call will. You know, I, I think the challenge that we face as a country and as a city is that the, the people who have been administrating our city a lot lack the ambition that the population does. There are some real specific challenges that we have as a city. We have the highest uh, degree of uh, the, the, the highest burden financially for social care and supporting vulnerable adults and children in our, in our city per head of population than any other city in the country outside of London. This absorbs a huge amount of the financial resources that we have as a city, and we don't have high revenue as high as other parts of the country in terms of the income we make from business taxes, because we have a high percentage of people working from home. So these pr 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 sort of present our city with huge challenges. We will have food recycling by 2023. It's in our city plan, as well as now the environment bill. Uh, Caroline and I share a huge set of cross-purpose aims here on the environment bill, but the government have just pulled it out of par our parliament and they're not gonna return it till the next uh, parliament now. So, you know, we, we are working together. There are things we want to do. Only 2% of our waste goes into landfill. 30% is recycled, that's up 6% uh, in the last couple of years, which is good, but it's that bit in the middle that we need to really, really work on. And we can do it with solid administration and extra resource. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is asked by Lily. And again, if you could say your name and school before you ask, um, ask it. Uh, Lloyd, then Caroline will answer this. Hi. Um... I'm Lily from Barney. Why is the Albion still polluting the sky with light? Um, 
Well, I think that's a good question, uh, Lily. It's, of course, the Albion needs to have floodlighting for match days. And I was very pleased that we managed to get that uh, um, stadium there, despite, of course, uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, and local Conservatives uh, in Lewis District spending millions and millions trying to do everything to stop it being built. You know, so it's right that we have a stadium in our city and it's right that it needs floodlights on some of the time. But it is on a lot of the time and we do need to think about supporting it to become uh, more um, more light polluting friendly. I've asked uh, the, because it's in my constituency, I've asked the um, dark sky uh, officer, uh, the South Downs National Park, because in the South Downs National Park we have a national uh, and, and it's recognised internationally, dark sky reserve. There are parts of the National Park you can go to where there is very little, if no, light pollution. So I've asked the officer, that they have two officers that are employed, if they could look at uh, the Albion situation and see what recommendations they have. It's not a case of just telling the Albion no light, and it might well be a case of saying, well, actually, turning off the Albion's lights doesn't really make much ecological or biodiversity uh, uh, changes unless you do it in X, Y, and Z way. And so that's why I want the officers to be able to advise, because because the, it, the Albion's not in one of the dark sky zone areas, but clearly it is a cause of concern for many residents. Uh, thank you, Lloyd. Now, Caroline, if you could answer, please. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Lily. Um, yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, I've raised it with Paul Barber, the chief executive um, at the football club, because many constituents have raised it with me uh, as well. Um, and he's explained, obviously, that not only do they need the lights for the games, which is, you know, understandable, but also he was explaining that uh, in order to um, make the pitch kind of worthy of a Premier League football club, then uh, they have artificial lights in order to regenerate the, the grass in the winter months to replace the natural light. So I, I understand that and I know the, the, you know, the economic benefit as well as the social benefit of having, having the club, obviously, it, it needs to be able to do that. But like Lloyd, um, I've been working with, uh, uh, in, in my case, with Amy Healy, who is the um, Green Party's chair of the Environment Committee, who's been meeting with campaigners and indeed with the South Downs National Park uh, Dark Skies officers, trying to come up with some kind of memorandum of understanding that would reduce the impact to the extent possible, which might be, have something to do with the timings of when the lighting is on, the type of the lighting, the angle of it, and so forth. So I think it is about trying to find a workable compromise where we do what's necessary to enable the, the football club to operate, you know, at, at, the, at the high level it does and that we want it to, but also minimizes to the extent possible the, um, the inconvenience and, 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 and real distress actually caused to, to some local residents. Uh, thank you both for your answers. Okay, so we now have two questions um, around the school curriculum um, from Ted and Olivia. So if you could um, all answer the question, um, one, minute, one minute each, and you can decide to foc like decide which question uh, you choose to focus on. Um, so yeah, Ted and Olivia. Uh, hi, I'm Ted, and uh, we were wondering how you're planning to integrate uh, the climate crisis into the school curriculum. Great, and then Olivia? Hi, I'm Olivia from Hove Park. My question is, as eco-reps, what would be the most effective thing we can do in school to create a positive impact on the climate? Great. So if, uh, Peter, you could start by answering the question. Yeah, I, I think what we need to do, uh, and I've been chair of governors, uh, I know there's people here from BACA, which is great because I was chair of governors of BACA for, for seven years. You know, what we learned there about other, other uh, areas of um, sort of so social policy that we wanted to get into the curriculum was not to segregate it and teach it in one subject. And that's what I feel very strongly we shouldn't do with climate change. If we do a climate change lesson once, twice a week, it kind of packages it up and enables people to think about it in a compartmentalized way. In actual fact, climate change affects every part of our uh, lives, from our home life to our professional life, to the way we move between our home and professional lives. And I think it needs to be integrated fully in any curriculum. So that means that you know science needs to, when you're teaching science, link it to climate change. When you're doing maths, you know, s solve problems, mathematical problems with, with uh, climate change. 
you know, when we're talking about social policy, talk about some of the social aspects of climate change. I think this is the way to, 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 to integrate it in the curriculum in a meaningful way, because actually it helps us deal with it in a holistic, uh, you know, f fully rounded way, rather than thinking I'm that climate going change. going to need to cut you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, Samir? Uh, thanks, Rania, and thanks, Ted and Olivia. I think I'm going to agree with Peter here because, uh, again, you know, lockdown has shown that you can get your learning from anywhere. And, and I think compartmentalizing that is probably not the right way forward. I mean, I spent a good chunk of the last few years working with, 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 with cities to, to bust the silos, if you like, and actually connect the things because you cannot solve any of, of our problems in isolation from, from the other one. And, you know, in a sense, looking at the curriculum, I think we need that. Even looking at practice, I think that's becoming more obvious. So when you look at Hydrogen Sussex and all of the innovation that's happening, Brighton and Hove is working with other cities in the region. And it's that kind of integration um, that's absolutely crucial. And I see it when I'm working with the Thames Estuary, you know, we're working with the cultural industries. And, and, you know, you can't build film studios, for example, without training electricians. You know, I think one problem is really, really involved with the other one. And I think like Peter, you know, I was chair of governors at, at St. John the Baptist in Kemp Town for a few years, you know, and we worked with Brighton College because they reached out because that kind of collaboration is absolutely important. Certainly what I think all of this. I'm going to need to cut you too. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, Lloyd? Okay, well, um, I think uh, Peter is right that we need to integrate it, and as Samir as well, integrate it into the curriculum. I used to be on the board of Bradford University. Um, um, what we did there, I know that's a higher, uh, higher education, but what we did there is we changed the rules. Um, so no new courses could be approved unless they had integrated sustainable development throughout them. So a course in engineering, a course in optometry, a course in had to reflect environmental and sustainable um, teaching methods, but also teaching content in it to be approved. It wasn't that we sweeped away everything else, but we said new stuff coming forward had to be like that. I think there's something to be done at that at a secondary level, particularly. Um, SEED, the sustainable, Sustainability and Environmental Education um, organization, I've spoken uh, at their conferences many times when we were negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals, is a very good base for that. And if your teachers aren't connected with them, it's good to prompt teachers to connect. And they've got loads of resources about how teachers can start to integrate it into the, the curriculum, but also how students can be involved. And then finally, I'm a patron at St. John's Special School. And one of the things we've done there is we've managed to get solar panels on the roof. Now there is a scheme to allow schools to do that at almost no cost to them. If your school doesn't do that, do, lots of schools do in the area, if your school doesn't, then badger your school to start investing in some of that because that is no cost to them and it really can make a difference. Thank you very much. And Caroline? Thanks. I'm going to try and answer both questions really, really fast because uh, I don't think anyone's addressed the question about what can um, uh, eco reps and school do to create a positive impact and I just want to say speak out and know your power and I want to really pay tribute to the student climate strikers who I think have just done such an extraordinary job of putting climate change at the top of the political agenda so um, yeah know that you can make a real difference because you are um, Amy Healy as I said who's the uh, chair of the environment committee she's only aged 25 and she had a special message to say please do uh, lobby the council. Right now there is a consultation going on, for example, about reducing congestion, decarbonising transport. Do get your voices heard there. Um, as others have said, schools can be a real microcosm in terms of changing the environment for the better. So yes, you could try and get those solar panels on your school roofs, but you could even do something as simple as changing where the electricity comes from for your school. So get it from a, a greener energy source like electricity, green energy, that's good too. Um, in terms of the curriculum, then I agree with what others have said about mainstreaming it, but I want to have a, a, a quick highlight for the fact that I also think as well as mainstreaming it, we should have what I've been lobbying for for a number of years, which is getting a bit closer. And that is a GCSE in natural history. Mm -hmm. We have lost our ability to really feel connected to nature and to know it with the intimacy that many of our forebears did. And my worry is that unless we really know and love nature, then we're less likely to protect it. And having a de dedicated space on the curriculum where for those people for whom, you know, really getting out and observing the birds and the mammals and the amphibians and the insects and so forth 
is something that's going to inspire so many young people. So yes, of course, um, instrument, but how to make it well. <laughs> Thank, <you. laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So um, our next question is asked by Izzy and Samir, then Lloyd will answer this. Hi, my name's Izzy and I'm from Long Hill. And my question is, why don't all public buildings have low energy motion sensor lights so that less harmful greenhouse gases are being produced? Fantastic. Thank you for that, Izzy. And I think, do you know what? It's that is, is definitely part of the problem that our, our office buildings particularly are facing. So not only our, our public buildings, we're doing two things. A, we're decarbonizing the grid in the sense so that electricity that is coming to our buildings is actually greener than at any other time in our history and certainly greener than what a lot of other countries are also doing. I think more importantly, there is a lot of innovation coming through in public buildings, in office buildings. I mean, there is a team in, in the Netherlands, which is doing, I think, what is effectively the smartest, most sustainable and healthier building ever. And it gives you control over your light in a sense, you know, and it's got circadian light, meaning that your light, which you control actually changes during the day. So that kind of then, it doesn't necessarily begin to negate the need for low energy motion sensors. It actually means that because the buildings are smart, because they're only using the energy that they need to use at any given time of day, because they're adaptable and because they are being in effect reused, you know, and, and part of this has been accelerated by the pandemic. It just means that the innovation is coming from other places as well. And I think if you bear that in mind, it just means that there's a lot of, buildings, not only public, like I said, office buildings, our own homes even, will actually be much smarter than simply a sensor coming on as you come into the space and a sensor coming off into the space. It's about building materials, about integrating tech. As, as you know, others have said before, it's making sure that we integrate our construction, our architecture, our design, our lighting, our energy, all in one place. And, and I think for me, because this is the field I work in, it's having the professionals who are able to understand all of this and then deliver it, if you like, for you, so that that would be the kind of building that you will work in and on, I think more importantly as well in the future. Thank you for your answer. And um, now Lloyd, please. Um, well, it requires us to do more to invest. And the reality is it requires us to legislate properly. When Labour last left government, there was a binding commitment that new buildings would be zero carbon. And that's not just housing, and Peter's mentioned it uh, in housing, but it was also with office buildings as well. Um, and that we would move towards a standard. And I remember, again, uh, with the Labour government, there was resources for education institutions to not only invest in building properly, but to make sure those buildings were of high standard. And we were pushing for BREEAM, which is one of those standards for sustainable development, that every building that we were pushing for should be outstanding um, and beyond. But the reality is the Conservatives ripped out the money from, uh, from school building programmes, they ripped out the money from other public works programmes, and we've had a decade now of absolutely no money invested in these things. And whilst they might make savings in the long run, if you've not got cash in the short run, you just can't do it. And it's not just about lights, but lights are one of those things. It's about a holistic look in making sure those buildings are properly working for us. And that means that we need to go street by street, community by community to make sure it happens. But it needs government action on this. And I'm afraid we've now had two pushing backs of the government deadline to this. And it almost makes me feel like the government's all talk, but no action. Um, thank you for your answer, Lloyd. OK, great. So um, the next question I'll ask on the behalf of Esme from Baca, um, and it'll be answered by Caroline and then Peter. So some species of wildlife in the UK are in decline. Over the past year, we have seen more wildlife return. What do you think we can do to stop the decline of wildlife and increase it in the UK? For example, hedgehogs, badgers and birds, and especially in Sussex. Um, so Caroline? Thank you. Well, I'm really grateful for this question because the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Nationally, we're failing on 17 out of 20 biodiversity targets. There's a big summit this year, not just the climate summit in Glasgow, but a biodiversity and nature summit in China in May. And we really need the government to up its game there. 
there are so many things that we could be doing um, nationally, things like the kinds of pesticides, the intensified agriculture, all of those things are having an incredible impact on our wildlife. And we need to move to less pesticide ridden agriculture, more uh, organic agriculture. But locally, I want to just give a shout out to things like the rewilding project at the Waterhall Golf Course. You may know that um, there was a decision of the council basically to rewild that golf course and it aims to restore you know, swathes of pristine uh, grassland. Um, there are hopes that we'll be able to see sort of basking adders and, and butterflies and dormice and all kinds of things there. So do get involved in that because that's uh, I think a, a really exciting proposal. We're also, um, we've got something in the budget uh, that's coming before council soon suggesting there should be a rewilding officer too who's in charge of of how we go about promoting that in the city so there's loads of things we can be doing locally as well as changing policy nationally and that's what i'm trying to do thank you very much uh peter thanks in addition to what caroline said which i uh, fulsomely agree with you know that there are th this is one of the areas where national policy is important for example the government just decriminalized use of certain pesticides that will have a profound impact on on insects particularly bees and we know how crucial they are to the to the food chain and to to, to the pollination and so forth in our to the ecosystem uh, globally so you know the government are you know using the freedoms they've got from brexit to do really quite harmful things but locally there are things we can do as individuals and we need to be made more aware of what we can do as individuals things like bird feeders you know for specific types of birds are really good there are things we can do in our gardens and in our public spaces in urban areas that make life much much easier for wildlife to flourish and grow and in a targeted way pet owners need to realize that if you put like you know a bell on the cats, it stops them uh, catching birds you know, these are the sorts of things that we can do in an urban area, which really help wildlife flourish. Otherwise, we'll end up in a place like where I live, where it's all seagulls and almost nothing else. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So um, our next question is asked by Nathaniel and Peter, then Samir will ask it. Hi, I'm Matt Marshall, I'm from Cardinal Newman. The visual change, such as choosing to live more sustainably, or should there be more focus on the action of businesses and the transport industry and stuff like that that are more harmful? Thank you. Do you want me to go? Um, it was Samir first, actually, sorry. Ah, okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, was that? oh, apologies, I thought it was Peter first, but it's not to worry. Um, look, so thank you, Nat, for that. And it's, it's you know, as a governor of, of Cardinal Newman, thank you. For, for being here. Look, I think it's both. Um, I don't think it's it's one or or the other because I think you know it's that's how you bridge bridge the gap in, in effect. And that's what I think a lot of us do. Certainly businesses do have a role. And and one thing I would I would say as somebody who works in the areas of cities and supporting cities globally, there is a lot of money out there for cities to do the things that cities want to do. There's certainly no shortage of of, of, of investment that we have tools that effectively force businesses to do the things that we want them to do. And certainly there are, you know, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, you know, set up the task force for, you know, related disclosures, which means wherever businesses are doing harm, they have to disclose and then they have to put the money in order to address these things. You know, so that's one thing that is happening. And we now have a task force for nature related disclosures as well. We've got things like biodiversity, net gain and, an environmental net gain, which means that developers, investors, everybody who has money to invest somewhere effectively needs to leave the place better than what it was when they first, you know, got, got hold of it. So I think all of those are going on in the background. And certainly the development banks, you know, the EBRD, whether we also here in the future have our own UK development bank, will have criteria that means we have to invest in decarbonization and we have to invest in place and we have to invest in people's health and, and well-being in a sense and in decarbonizing transport. You know, you need the buses that you have, whether it's uh, electric or hydrogen, as we've got the, the momentum now building up in Sussex. We're learning from our colleagues in Canterbury. We're learning from our colleagues in the Northeast certainly where all of this innovation is happening. And, and all I would say is there is money there, but there's also the responsibility on businesses and we have the tools to hold businesses to account 
for delivering the things that we want them to um, deliver. Uh, thank you for your answer. And Peter? Thank you. I think we need to treat climate change increasingly as if it were a public health crisis. We've learned during COVID that a, we need a national mission in order to overcome it and tackle it. That means that government needs to regulate, it needs to do big policy, and government needs to do things that only government can do, such as invest massively in the vaccine program and support innovation wherever it is, but make sure it's coordinated centrally, right through to individual action. And that means you and I uh, acting in, in, in ways that we act impacts the health directly of our neighbours and people we share a community with. That's how we need to tackle climate change. Central policy making on things like energy generation and decarbonising energy through regulation of things like uh, transport, uh, right through to personal action. You know, so myself, I've over a period of five years decarbonised the flat that I live in, so it's now zero carbon. Um, and I've taken gas out of my uh, flat. So it's going to be a combination of personal action, uh, the way we spend, consumer spending is going to influence businesses, but regulation and policy making will also influence businesses. Uh, and only if we treat it together as a national mission with solid policy making and individual action and a sense of national purpose are we really going to achieve not just zero carbon, net carbon by 2050, but hopefully much, much sooner. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. So um, the two last questions from Elsie and Harrison. Um, and then if we could have um, all four of you answer the question, you can again choose which one you decide to focus on or address both in your answers. Um, so Elsie. Hi, I'm Elsie from the Hove Park. What are you going to do to make our community more eco-friendly? Thank you. And Harrison? Uh, hello, I'm Harrison. I go to Brighton College. And what advice would you give to young people who want to make a difference in their community? Great. So if we could have an answer from Lloyd first. Um, well, what am I doing uh, specifically in the local community? I'm really at the moment pushing to try and uh, get some of the low-car uh, uh, neighbourhoods in uh, St George's Road, just down the road from Brighton College, you know, where the co-op is. I actually think we need to be pushing to see whether we can turn that into a no-car area. The local businesses are really on board, local community is really on board. It's just about trying to get those uh, details sorted and we're trialling, the, the administration's trialling one out elsewhere. So I'm pushing for that because I think that that will make a difference to um, how people live their lives, but also how people start to um, uh, uh, you know, kind of not only travel, but start to consume more locally, which I think is, to me, one of the real keys. What can you do is I think you can make sure you get your voice heard, whether that's engaging with policymakers or whether actually it's taking clear and direct action. Caroline has mentioned, of course, the, um, the, the, the protests that many young people took part in last year, but I think there are other things that you can do as well, leading up to COP to make sure this government knows that the feet are on the fire because individual actions I think are important, but actually we need to be working here to get collective actions to change the way that we are consuming things in our society. Thank you very much. Caroline? Thank you. Well, my advice um, is to please get involved. The climate crisis is the fight of our lives and you know, the moral authority you have as young people looking in the eye, our generation and saying basically that we have screwed your future is incredibly powerful. So please get involved, particularly as Lloyd says in the run up to the uh, climate COP. What I'm doing both locally, one of the big passions I have is around something like home insulation. It doesn't sound very exciting, but we waste so much energy out of our leaky homes. So trying to get street by street home insulation projects working is something that I'm trying to do. The government had what it called its green grant scheme, but it's been a complete disaster. They've not given any money out and now they've said they're not even going to continue it into the future. So we need locally led, properly resourced insulation locally. But if I can just give a quick shout out for the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. It's a mouthful, but basically it's a private members bill that I'm bringing. And I would love you to support that um, and maybe have debates in your schools around it, because what it does is to update our current climate legislation. Net zero by 2050 is utterly useless. It's like, you know, Greta Thunberg says, act as if your house is on fire because it is. Well, if your house is on fire, you don't bring the fire brigade and ask them to come in 30 years time. We need action now. And this new bill would absolutely be about much more urgent action about tackling nature as well as climate and crucially having a big 
emergency parliamentary assembly that young people can get involved in as well, a citizens assembly to advise and to support and to direct parliament and government ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, with regards to what I've been doing, uh, I've, I've put a huge amount of energy to try and decarbonise our transport locally, electric buses and trying to move towards hydrogen buses locally. Uh, you know, I've pushed very, very hard to get the on-street par uh, electric parking infrastructure in place, even went out with the teams and invited the team that's doing it to Parliament, where I hosted the first debate in Parliament on the electrification of uh, infrastructure for cars and transport. Uh, so I'm trying really hard on that. The thing about you and young people getting involved, yes, you need to make your voice heard. Yes, you need to organise and yes, you need to communicate as much as possible. But I'm going to say something that's just really... <laughs> <laughs> the most difficult thing to say and the thing you probably want to hear the least. The thing you can do the most is to maximise your potential as students, to work as hard as you can, to work as structured as you can, so you come out of school and education the best qualified you can, so that you can contribute to solving the problems going forward in science, in maths, in communication and the way we tackle, and also coming into politics uh, uh, being young people who have completely and utterly maximised your potential as students. So please give, give studying everything you've got. I had to return to secondary school when I was 25. It's a lesson I learned the hard way. So I don't want anybody to have to do what I did in order to maximise their potential. So yes, get involved and community, you there. but study hard. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Samir? Um, thank you, Rania, and thank you, um... Elsie and Harrison, look, so on, on question one, I think as, as the councillor for Hope Park, I think we are fortunate that we have Hope Park, Hope Breck, the three cornered cops. And I think what we really should be doing, all of us, is looking after them better. You know, certainly there's, there's always things that come into my inbox, things that are happening. And, you know, it's always a fight back in a sense. But, you know, certainly that's something all of us, all of us can do. We've got a big tree planting program coming forward. In, in the area, and I think that's an absolute, that's an absolute must. Certainly, decarbonizing new development is 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 you know for me top. Anything that comes through the system, if it's not net zero, if I sit on planning committee, I say no because I think you know we really need to set the bar high, and I think we need to focus on on skills as as others have said. Not only the skills we've learned, but the skills we always have to learn. You know. I've got a PhD, I teach at university, but I'm doing courses later this month because I think there's certain things that I really need to also beef up my own skills. So that learning doesn't stop. And we learn from other cities. You know, I work with Rockefeller, we worked with Milan and Barcelona. So how can we localize that experience in Brighton and Hove is top of, is top of my list. Um, in terms of I what- I need to cut you there, Samir. In terms of, can I just quickly, yeah, in terms of the up. difference, yeah. you know, I think you need to be curious. You are curious and you are here and you are leading, but I think continue to be curious because that's one of the most effective tools in your toolbox. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for all the questions and thank you for all the answers. Um, we'll now have um, a poll section, which Ben will quickly introduce. So now introducing the poll section. So the speakers have actually um, put forward questions for um, us young people to answer. So um, while these are being put forward to you, do um, any of the MPs or councillor want to um, um, explain why they've asked this question? Um, I can jump in, Ben, because this is, this is my question. And in a sense, um, I asked, it, I had a conversation earlier in the week with, with, lawyer friends in, who work in London and Vincent Mason, but actually they're doing a lot of stuff on data and, and they're doing a lot of things on decarbonization. I said, look, you know, and, and I did ask, I said, look, Sue, what do you think I should, I should ask? And I said, look, these things are absolutely important uh, and it's things that all of us are doing, but it means, it, and it's a challenge, you know, and in a sense, the, the challenge for you here is, you know, which do you think we should do? And, uh, I am looking forward to seeing what comes back as a result of this. Thank you so much for that. Um, we'll just wait to have everyone answer the yeah. poll question, if you could. Yeah. I think this came on the back of, I think it was China that said that they've, they've experienced a 15% drop in population in 2020, partly on account of the pandemic and other things. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what comes back. Just going to share the results of that uh, now. Here, here, there here, you here, go. Here, here. Okay. There's your answer. <laughs> 
so yeah, we can see that um, eating less meat was the most popular choice there. But a lot of family planning going on in this generation. <laughs> <laughs> that that was one of the challenging bits to this question. I thought so. Okay, so forty three percent. That's interesting. Um, should we move on to the next poll question then? Let's see if that could uh, come up. Perfect. Now, um, Caroline, would you like to a brief discussion of why you've put this question forward? I just think we spent the last 45 minutes talking about young people's futures, your futures, and I think the most important thing is for you to have your say over your future. I mean, the, the decisions that politicians are making now are going to be affecting you a lot longer than they're going to be affecting the politicians who are making those decisions. And so it seems to me that the people who live longest with the consequences of those decisions should be the ones that have their say on it, particularly um, when what's at stake is literally the future of a, of a livable planet. You know, I'm trying to find all kinds of ways of trying to get young people's voices, the future generation's voices heard in, in political processes. And I have another private member's bill, which is called the Future Generations Bill. And it's learning from a, a, a piece of legislation in Wales where they have a Future Generations Act and a commissioner who can intervene in policy decisions on the basis that she believes that that policy is going to uh, mess up uh, things for, for future generations. And I want to see something similar uh, in, in England as well. But in the meantime, it feels to me that in, in encouraging and, and enabling younger people to, to, to be, to having their voices heard and to engage in the political system seems really important. Uh, thank you so much for that. And um, as you can see, it's a, a clear winner. There's a, a big yes for um, having the voting age lowered to 16, which is, um, Think very positive to see. If we could move on to the uh, next question, please. Cool. Um, Peter, would you like to give a brief background for us? Yeah, I want to know what your priorities are for us. You know, what do you think if you were the MP here, if you were a MP in Brighton or in you know the UK, what would your priorities be and what do you expect our priorities to be? Is it about raising awareness and using the platform? Is it about championing certain uh, positions that we take, certain policies that you think should be a priority? Or do you think we should be prioritizing our local uh, environment or the nationwide focus up in parliament and uh, working on nationwide and global issues? So that's what I'm really keen to, to figure out. Yeah, great question, and um, it'll be interesting to see the answer to this. I think we've just got a couple more people maybe to vote, and then I'll share results. So um, here we can see another clear winner of pushing governments for policies to get gas out of our homes. Oh, I love that. That's, that's my, that is my priority. <laughs> so <absolutely. laughs> no, great to hear. Um, I think that's it for the poll section, if I'm correct. Yes, unfortunately, we didn't get um, Lloyd in time, but I think he has got a question that he he would certainly like to ask people to think about, although we won't be able to do it as a as a poll. That's my fault. I'm sorry about that. I, we didn't get it to you on Thursday in time. My question was, wh what motivates you to take action? So what's the thing that gets you out of bed taking action most? Is it when you hear things from your teachers? Is it when you hear things from politicians, parents? Is it when you experience things directly, uh, hear from experts, or when you hear from your peers and friends? What, is, what messages uh, uh, message deliverers get through to you best? That's Should we right. give maybe 30 or 40 seconds for people to give an answer in the chat? It'd be quite nice to actually see if someone has an answer to that. Cool, so if if, um, if you want to answer that, just if you could put it in the chat, that'd be great.
very good. <laughs> that's um, great. Thank you guys for all your answers. Um, so that brings the poll section to an end. Uh, yeah. Over to you, Rania. Okay, so I just wanted to thank the students for coming. It's been amazing to hear all your questions and to see all of you here. Thank you very much to um, all the MPs and the councillor for taking the time to answer these questions. It's been really interesting to hear all of your answers. And thank you very much to all the organisers of um, this event. So thank you, Tamsin, Les, KT, Charlie and Hugh for organising this event, um, without which it would not have been possible. Um, we just wanted to close off this event with a couple of thoughts we have about um, climate-based education and youth being involved in climate action. Yeah, again, I just want to extend my thanks to all the speakers here, all the students and everyone who organised this great event. It's been really uh, encouraging to see this. Um, so I'd say it's just, yeah, it's been incredible to see the clear passion from everyone involved in this. And I think it's crucial that we keep up this passion and continue to open up discussions on this and hold those in power accountable. Personally, I think it's imperative that we as young people are involved in decision making as it empowers us to be the change we want to see, allowing us to shape our own future. In conjunction with this, we to have a better future, then we must be better educated on the climate issue. This is why I think it's essential that climate education should be implemented into standard education so that every young person can be knowledgeable on this issue. With the climate crisis so imminent, now is the time for these to be involved and active in the fight for our future. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, so similarly, it was amazing to see all of you students united in the space to ask questions about issues that are so fundamental to be tackled at the moment. It is so important to keep this momentum going, to continue to involve young people in local politics, to keep pushing for demands and keeping our politicians accountable to their words. Having this network of schools and students passionate about hearing and acting on climate change is an amazing resource for the future which, which, which should most definitely be made use of. In my experience, the best campaigns and the best actions happen when people come together with their different voices and experiences to come up with solutions for the present and the future. We need as many young people as possible inv involved in climate action and integrating climate into the school curriculum would be a big step forward towards achieving this. Campaigns such as Teach the, Teach the Future have been pushing for this. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for um, coming and um, so yeah, if you'd like to stay on um, students, it would be amazing to hear your thoughts on yeah, the school curriculum. Thanks so much for having me. Really thank appreciate you so much. it. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you everybody. It's been a pleasure.